Hello, welcome to my summary of electrical usage at our property in Huntingdonshire, England for the calendar year 2022. At the end, I'll give a few details about the investments made in our systems since October 2011. Here are the components which make up the system at the moment. And if you want detailed information on the bits and pieces, then please look at the info below the video. Though I doubt there will be many other properties structured in exactly the same way as ours. To start things off, here's the monthly electrical input from our two solar arrays and from the grid. The data comes from the aggregation of the daily readings of the electricity meter and the two solar generation meters. We have an Economy 7 supply and throughout the year our aim is to use as few normal rate units as possible. In the winter, the annex flat above our garage is heated by two storage heaters which can each pull around 20 units each night during the 7 hour low rate period. Our battery electric vehicle is also charged when necessary during that period. The power wall is also charged with low rate energy to see us through the 17 hour normal rate period, leaving a small amount of space for solar energy if the following day is forecast to be very sunny. Things are obviously different in the summer when the power wall is only charged overnight with grid energy when little solar input is expected. The top priority for solar energy is providing power to the property, then secondly to charge the power wall. When the power wall is full, Excess solar energy is diverted into the car via the zappy charger or can be used to heat the swimming pool. We aim to use as much of our generated energy as we can. Here are the figures for the year, though you shouldn't take them, especially the Tesla figures, as being anywhere near exact. During the year we generated 6,779 units of solar energy according to the generation meters, although the Tesla system measurement was 6,573, a difference of 3%. We imported 4,488 grid units, with 117 of those being at normal rate. The Tesla system measured this as 4,547 units, 1.3% more. The total electrical energy input was therefore 11,267 units, with the Tesla figure being 1.3% lower at 11,120. In the next section we have to work with the figures provided by the Tesla system and the My Energy system for the car charging figures. 617 units of excess solar were exported to the grid, which was 9.4% of the solar energy input or 5.5% of the total energy coming in. While we are happy to support the country's grid when we can't avoid doing so, we shall endeavour to be a little less generous next year. 2,158 units were used by the Zappi car charger. 3,482 units went into the power wall and 3,095 came back out, a round trip efficiency of around 89%. That leaves 7,958 units as the energy used by our house, the annex and the swimming pool. I don't have enough information to split the usage between those three energy sinks. I usually only make brief reference to money during my monthly reports, but I anticipate that many viewers are here to try and decide whether getting solar panels, and perhaps also a home battery, are reasonable investments. The figures I give are only really relevant to my own situation, and people diving into solar nowadays face a completely different financial situation. That situation can change unexpectedly, and certainly the upheaval a year ago wasn't foreseen by most people. What the spike in energy prices has done is make an investment in solar panels more viable, but with the increased demand many are having to wait a long time to get anything installed. Throughout 2022 we were, thankfully, locked into a long-term fixed tariff, paying 19.94 pence including VAT for each normal rate unit, and 9.77 pence for each low rate unit. The daily standing charge was 24.59 pence, so our total electricity bill was just over 540 pounds. Without the solar panels and power wall, all of our solar input would have instead come from normal rate units, which would have added at least another 700 pounds to the bill. We don't have gas in the village, and at the moment our heating comes from burning oil. We topped up the tank in February at 62 pence per litre, just as the price was starting to rise, 
and refilled in August at 92 pence per litre for a total cost just over £1,100. Our total energy cost for the year was therefore about £1,640. That doesn't sound bad to me for a five bedroom house, a studio flat annex and a fully electric car. We have recently received government payments to offset against this cost. Two augmented pensioner winter fuel payments and three of the six energy bill support scheme payments, a grand total of £699. We have therefore paid just over £940 in 2022 for our energy. Before the end of March, we will receive a further three energy bill support scheme payments, totalling £201, which will be included in next year's figures, plus £200 alternative fuel payment in February towards the heating oil. Being at the tail end of a long-term fixed price electricity tariff, the energy price guarantee hasn't really affected us so far. Next is a small section on our electric car. These figures are for the energy which went through the Zappi, but not all would have gone into the car's battery, as some would have been used in getting the battery into optimum condition for charging. 1,415 solar units and 743 grid units were used in home charging at a cost of around £74. 342 units were used in charging away from home, at various rates from 2.2 kilowatts from a domestic socket to just over 100 kilowatts at a rapid charger, at a total cost of £125.31. That's a total of just over 2,500 kilowatt hours, costing just under £200. We only drove 4,643 miles in 2022 at an average cost per mile of 4.3 pence. Apart from a bottle of screen wash, our car has not cost us anything else in the year, depreciation not included. The car says that it has done an average of two and a half miles per kilowatt hour that has come out of the battery, but the figures show that it has only done 1.9 miles per kilowatt hour that was used in charging. Finally, here are some figures for what I call long-term investment costs and revenue. When we had our 16 panel 4 kilowatt southwest system installed back in October 2011, a couple of months after moving in, the cost was a hefty £14,000 or thereabouts. However, getting the installation done just before the reduction in feed in tariff payments made it seem worthwhile according to my back of envelope calculations. We received £750 back for referrals when three of our friends used the same company, giving a net cost of around £13,250. When the total of the feed-in tariff payments had passed that initial cost, I persuaded my wife that we should make a further investment by getting a home battery and went for the Tesla Powerwall in early 2020. In order to pay only 5% VAT, we had to get some solar panels installed at the same time. So a 10 panel 3 kilowatt system was put on our steep southeast facing garage roof, conveniently close to the corner of the garage where all of our electrical stuff is located. The total cost, including installation, was £12,900. When I bought my Powerwall, it was expected that the price would thereafter begin to fall. However, my local installer told me last summer, when I was thinking of getting a second Powerwall, that the price has gone up quite a bit and the waiting list is over a year, with Tesla reportedly prioritising clients who want to install Tesla solar panels or tiles at the same time. Against this total investment of £26,150, we have so far received feed-in tariff payments of £20,156. At a very basic level of accounting, that means there is still nearly £6,000 to be recovered which will take approximately a further two and a half years of feed-in tariff payments. After that, there will be another 11 and a bit years of feed-in tariff payments coming in, if we survive that long. We will have to decide what to do with that when the time comes, although the major cost of installing a heat pump, probably a ground source, to replace the oil boiler will have to be considered. When we started in 2011, we could not foresee where we would be now, as there have been so many progressions and changes in technology and thinking since then, as well as the volatility in energy prices. Similarly, we don't know what the future will hold, but we are very happy with our investments so far. 
I wonder when personal nuclear fusion plants will become available.